Hi, welcome to Blogging Heads TV. You're watching Culturally Determined, and I'm your host, R.A. Cohen-Wade, and my guest today is Sonny Bunch. Uh, Sonny, could you introduce yourself? I'm Sonny Bunch. I'm the executive editor of the Washington Free Beacon, uh, co-host of the weekly substandard podcast, if you're into that sort of thing, and, uh, uh, I don't know, guy on the internet. Um, and most importantly for this conversation, um, you're the author of a recent cover story, in the Weekly Standard called Overload, well, any shows from the golden age of TV endure. Uh, so that's yes. that's what we're going to be talking about today. I thought the piece was really interesting, um, so thanks so much for coming on to discuss it. Um, can you kind of lay out the... It's a long piece, and I encourage people to read sure. it. We'll include a link below. Um, uh, can you talk about why sure. you were interested in exploring this topic? Yeah, yeah I, uh, it's, it's something I've been thinking about for a while, and I know a lot of people are kind of talking about like peak TV, now, this idea that there's just so much uh, out there. And the thing that I had started talking about with my editor on this piece, uh, whose name is Adam Kuyper at the Weekly Standard, um, was not so much, you know, uh, about how there's too much TV now, though that is that is a big portion of this piece. It's it was it was kind of thinking about what will last, what will what will last beyond uh, our current moment, you know, because everyone thinks that whatever moment they're in is like the most important and the best. And there's all sorts of great stuff that will be around forever. Uh, and history has shown that that is very, very <laughs> rarely true. I mean, I, like y y not everything lasts, not everything can last. Um, and I think TV has some interesting structural problems when thinking about what will, you know, kind of last beyond this current moment. And one of them is simply length, like the average TV, you know, a great TV show, like The Wire is 60 hours long or, um, you know, uh, one of my personal favorites, The Shield, is 88 episodes long. And, you know, those are 45 minutes each, so it's not quite 88 hours. But, like, you know, th these things go on a long time. So, you know, the difference between sitting down and watching The Wire, uh, the way I kind of described it in this piece is, you know, you could read War and Peace and Crime and Punishment <laughs> and Moby Dick and still have a little bit of time left over. And it, it, this is not to denigrate David Simon or The Wire. I think the fourth season of The Wire is one of the best things that the medium of television has ever done. But I, I like there are just structural issues when it comes to uh, uh, thinking about what will last. And, what, and the biggest of them is simply, I think, time. I think people just don't necessarily have the time to go back and re-watch uh, uh, a lot of programs. And TV is a format... That for the longest time, and I don't know that this is necessarily true anymore, but it, for the longest time, is a, it's a format that that kind of earned its respect in repetition, right? Like shows like The Simpsons or Cheers or, you know, sy the syndication model, uh, especially with regard to uh, the sitcom, was kind of key to creating these these canonical texts. Mm -hmm. And, and it, I, I, so I guess I'm kind of at maybe at the, bleeding edge of this because I don't, um, we stopped, we're core cutters, uh, in this household. And, um, so I don't watch cable and we get really bad reception also. So we barely watch live TV either. And when mm -hmm. I was a kid, yeah, like, like Simpsons was on like three or four times a day, it seemed right. like, and, si and Seinfeld was on at least once a day and it was just kind of like the background noise and you could imbibe this stuff. And I feel like, yeah, now that like so, so many Channels that used to air reruns now have their own original programming. Like, is, is syndication still even really a thing? Well, I, you know, this is, this is, I think, a real... Uh, uh, I, so, I think two things kind of... Two things kind of competingly, uh, for lack of a better word, which is, on the one hand, I think that sitcoms are going to be the hardest hit by the future of the medium of television, which I think is getting away from the syndication model. You know, like there's just so much stuff out there to watch. It almost feels like a waste, like a criminal waste of your time to sit there and watch a 25 year old episode of Seinfeld or, you know, a 20 year old episode of, of the Simpsons or whatever. Uh, on the other hand, I do think that the format of the Simpsons, right, which is essentially, it's essentially an anthology of short stories if you want to think about it that way. So, like, the, you, there's no need to watch, say, 5,000 hours of The Simpsons, however many episodes there are now. You know, the, you, can, you could actually uh, envision a world in which, you know, 
you you have collections of the best episodes, and that's what kind of passes on through the years, um, as opposed to something like say The Sopranos or uh, even even shorter series like Deadwood or uh, you know something in that in that vein. So I think they're 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 kind of competing ideas on what will last and why it will last. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I do think that the dissolution of the syndication model, and look, syndication isn't going anywhere. Syndication, there's still going to be hours to fill on network TV that aren't filled by original programming. Um, but I, I do think that the, the percentage of the audience that is watching these kind of like evergreen repeats is going to, uh, decline and diminish over time. Yeah, I mean, The Simpsons, maybe we should think about that for another minute, is unique in that it's uh, a cartoon, obviously, and seems to exist in a kind of eternal present. Um, there are a lot, there are like contemporary references in the episodes, but the things that have become almost a, um, you know, a common culture of the internet are more like, are more of the, you know, non, non time limited uh, mm-hmm. cultural references and, mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And it's, I mean, but the kind of, but Simpsons is still a going concern and almost no one seems to watch it, watch it anymore. Um, yeah. because it got really bad about 10 or 15 years ago, but they're still turning it out. So, you know, the kid who is watch it was like eight years old today and watching the Simpsons and seeing the reruns, like the crappy episodes are going to be yeah. stuck in with, with the, you know, season right. eight classics. So, right, right. I, I don't, so yeah, so there, there, it seems like that's kind of shared, like the can- know, canonicity of the Simpsons is, yeah. is not long for this world. I would actually just random as a random aside, and maybe this already exists. I should have Googled it before I got on, on, on the, the Skype with you, but the, I would actually be really curious to know, you know, the website freaky act. Yeah. Which like kind of, I would be really curious to know what percentage of quotes and images and gifts that are produced from that come from each season. Like if I had to guess, I would bet that 80% of the, the material produced from that, uh, from, from that website spans about six seasons. Yeah. About, about, well, what is that now? 20% of the show. I mean, I like, I would be, I would be, but I would be very curious to see what the, what the actual breakdown on that is. Yeah, some grad student out there should uh, should do an analysis. There was, did you see the the um, <laughs> blog post by the guy who rewatched the entirety of The Simpsons in like two and a half months and then no. did an analysis of it? It was <laughs> it was interesting. He he kind of he broke down the um, the core Lisa episode uh, having like seven beats of like Lisa. I can't remember exactly, but it's like Lisa identifies a problem. She comes up with an idea to solve the problem. Like no one agrees with her. Uh, she, she, and then it ends up with like Lisa disappointed and the te- everyone else like going back to how they, how they were before she tried to change mm-hmm. things. Um, and he said that the show got a lot more caustic, um, as the seasons went on and used Lisa more as like a punching bag, um, yeah. for the, for the other, other characters. Anyway, well, I'll, I'll hunt down the link and we'll, I'll include that below. It was interesting. Um, so am I misreading you by thinking that in the end, you kind of think that there will never be a TV canon that we well, look back on? <clears throat> uh, I think it's a possibility. I mean, like, you know, my, what, one thing I, I did kind of want to emphasize in this piece is that I really love all of these shows that I'm writing about. I mean, I, uh, almost all of them, I, I really, I really actually do enjoy them and find them, find them all pretty entertaining. Um, but I do think that just, from a from a like purely uh, functional or mechanical point of view, it will be hard to create a kind of common core that you see in say novels or film or anything like that. Just because the idea of getting getting enough people to uh, just to watch, let alone agree with uh, the the various programs, will be will be very difficult. I don't. I, I am skeptical of the ability of, uh, you know, the kind of cultural elite to, uh, conform the will of the world to, you know, their, 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 their view of these things, but uh, we'll see. I don't know. This is a, you know, one of, one of the, I, I think maybe possibly a little bit frustrating things about this piece is that I don't have like a big solution or a big, you know, this is the way it's definitely going to be at the end of it. And a few people have been like, wow, I read 5,000 words for that. But you did. <laughs> Go And everyone should. Uh, or at least just click on it. Open it up on your laptop. It'll be fine. Um, yeah, I, I mean, talking about, the, you know, the canon and you talk about um, Harold Bloom's The Western Canon. 
um, you know, I was I was an English major, and you had to take a required um, two semesters called Major English Poets. And so it started with the Canterbury Tales, and it went to the Fairy Queen, and then John Donne, and then Paradise Lost, and you know Wordsworth, and it step, steps through. Like, could there could there ever be like TV a TV studies major? And like, what I, what, what would they like? What would they yeah. watch as as the like core text? Well, there there are certainly TV studies programs that are I think largely built around making TV, right? Like you you and I think. It, it is incumbent upon those people to understand the history of the medium and kind of how, uh, uh, you know, it, it has evolved and the, the kind of linkages from, from show to show and, and, and what you're, what, what everyone's doing. Um, but the idea of having, you know, look, I, when I was, when I, when I went to school, I took three or four film courses and, uh, just thinking about like how you would teach a TV class, I wasn't entirely sure. Could you maybe just show one season of Justified and be like, "Here's, <laughs> here's, you know, this is emblematic of FX's, you know, <laughs> right. uh, uh, in, in innovative early period." Or would you, you know, could you, you could do that with maybe like an American Horror Story or something like that, and an, and an anthology. But you know, I, I, I don't know that you could really teach a class that is like here's a chapter from a novel, right? I mean, I guess you can. I, I wasn't an English major, so I, well, I don't it, have... Like, it actually, it reminds me a little bit of, you know, when you when we did the Canterbury Tales, we didn't read the whole thing. When we did the Fairy Queen, we read the, the first book. And then, mm-hmm. you know, we, we moved on. So with poetry, it's it's more like you can... You don't feel the, the need to read the entire corpus uh, to get, you know, to learn something mm-hmm. about a particular uh, particular poet. And, yeah, so maybe... Maybe just season one of The Sopranos, and then mm-hmm. you would move on, move on to something else. But even that right. is is like a, just a big time commitment. I, I I don't know. Like I suppose you could you could devote a whole like you know thirteen week class to like season one of The Sopranos and just like covering it in a week or so seems kind of crazy. Yeah, yeah. I or you know you could do I don't know three weeks on. I mean, I, if you if you break it down, if you think about it in terms of hours watched, right? This first season of Sopranos would be thirteen hours, and I feel like most English classes have like what a ten to fifteen hour per week reading load, or is that is that a bit? That's, much that'd probably be a bit much, but yeah, yeah, something along those lines. Like, yeah. yeah. So you could do it. I, I maybe the future is is like you know in the nineteen in the nineteen sixties and nineteen seventies. Uh, a lot of colleges were offering film courses for the first time. You know, uh, there's a there's a good essay by um, Dwight McDonald in one of his one of his collections, just talking about going from campus to campus and like talking about the European films at the time with the students there. And uh, it's kind of interesting, like, to watch the formation of how uh, uh, you know what was important or what was interesting was kind of determined. Um, and I think you could do something like that with TV, but, uh, you know, most of, most of the TV based courses now are weird, kind of like the philosophy of Buffy, which is like, Mm -hmm. you know, a way to kind of look at other philosophical ideas through the lens of the TV show. It's not really a study of the TV show itself. Um, so I, could you do a study a TV studies course? I think so. Probably. Um, and if you if you can, that is how the canon will start to form. The question is like, what do you include in that, and kind of what's the thought process behind going from show to show? Yeah, I mean, it's such a TV is such a huge part of our shared culture, and it's weird that it doesn't receive the, the, you know the level of analysis in the academy. At least as yeah. far as I know, maybe maybe it does. Um, so another question is, how does the the techno- technological change play into this and the fact that we do now have access to you know if, if you subscribe to the main services we basically have access to oh, like everything from the past 20 30 years at our yeah. fingertips and and we can you know we can instantly rewatch uh Seinfeld if we wanted to whereas when I was a lad you had to <laughs> turn on you know WPIX at 11:30 p.m. and and take whatever episode yeah. was, was served up to you. Yeah. Well, I think it's a two edged sword. I mean, I do think it is, I, it's great that we have access to everything that, you know, we, we'd watched in the past, 
Uh, and I think, or at least an increasing amount of it, there are still some weird blind spots, but, uh, I know like ER was recently put on Hulu, I think. And I was, and I was just watching. trying to decide yeah. uh, whether to rewatch ER and yeah. my wife was not enthusiastic and I, well, I kind of I mean, wanted I, to I give know. it a shot. Well, yeah, what would what would the point really be of rewatching all of ER? Like, I just can't. Yeah, I I I, 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 I mean, I gave up at some point around like season eleven. Um, yeah, but yeah, like I do have fond memories of watching that, and it was like innovative for its time. Sure, sure, but I, I, you know, the 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 on the one hand you have all the old stuff, but on the other hand you have all the new stuff, and there's so much new stuff, right? Like. Uh, you know, Netflix every week is or feels like is, you know, dropping another 13 hours of television. And, you know, you've got stuff on Hulu, you've got stuff on Amazon Prime. Uh, I, the idea of like sitting down and say going through Law and Order, like from start to finish, like I that is just uh, yeah. but Law and Order is another weird show that like really benefits from the syndication model, right? Like yeah. Law and Order is a show that you can like, you're like, oh, God, I just need to relax for, you know. 45 minutes an hour. Let's see what's on TNT. Oh, good. It's a law and order marathon. That's, that's, that's some nice comfort food. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, but I, but like, I, I think the biggest change, you know, is it's a business model change, right? Uh, you, 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 you were moving away from syndication, like to this kind of like weekly or biweekly or monthly event sort of thing from Netflix or Amazon prime or whatever, that it's like, here's a new thing that you have to watch and here are all the episodes. You can watch them at your own speed, do it as fast or as slow as you want. And then of course that usually means like do it as fast as you can. So you can talk about it with everyone. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I question whether or not that is a healthy mode of artistic consumption. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that that's a, I think it's, it is, there's something to be said for taking a week in between each chapter um, or at least taking some time to, you know, sit and think, about what you've what you've just watched instead of just powering through you know six out six hours of Stranger Things in a night, which is a thing I've done. I you know I it's not it's not like I'm uh, exempting myself or thinking that I'm 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 better than everyone else. It just like this is this is just the way we do it now. And uh, I can say, I will say that I do think that I remember less of the shows that I watch in rapid fire succession. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I can barely remember what happened in the second or third or fourth season of House of Cards. Like, I, like it's all just kind of a big blur because you know, we spent like four days in a row watching, <laughs> watching, watching each season. Yeah, I gave up in season two of House of Cards. So, I mean, there's 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 almost like a pride when you're like, a, I mean, you're you're like I'm out. Yeah, and yeah. then it's it's like you can just put your you know the guilt is gone. It's like I, you know, I gave it a shot. No more for me. You know, moving on with my life. Yeah. Um, what do you think, like, I mean, it's, the binging is more like, it, it's almost more like the way we consume a book, because you could sit and read a book for three hours, um, and now you can sit and watch, you know, three hours or five hours or six hours of, of streaming television. Mm-hmm. So it it is a little bit more like going back to the original, you know, like, the, a weekly serialization is like, because of the like commercial constraints of television and radio, not like anything inherent right. in the storytelling right. medium. Yo, sure. Yeah. Uh, I think that's totally true. And it, but uh, you know, books are also interesting because like I, for instance, will read 20 or 30 minutes at a time and, you know, pick up a couple hours later, read a little more. Um, it, depending on the book, of course, you know, sometimes I'll just sit down and power through, through a, through a novel or whatever. Um, uh, but no, I, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, the artistic limitation, the commercial limitations imposed on TV um, and the way people worked around them, like uh, uh, Matthew Weiner with Mad Men or uh, um, even The Simpsons, which uh, like changed from a three commercial break to a, or a three segment show to like a four segment show hmm. maybe 10 years ago. Uh, to kind of give it, give them more room to play with on the on the 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 act breaks. Um, I, I think there's, I think there is something interesting to be said about the way limits can help improve artistry. Yeah. Uh, but but also, I, I, you know, one of the weird things in this world of streaming is how little they've actually, 
how little most of these companies have actually monkeyed with the basic formats of these shows, right? You, if you have, if you don't have the strictures of commercial breaks, and if you can just put as much stuff out there as you want, uh, you know, why are we still kind of limiting ourselves to the idea of one-hour dramas that are ten to thirteen episodes in length, mm -hmm. or thirty-minute comedies that are twelve to thirteen episodes in, in length per season? You know, like I would, I would be, I. I and we're seeing a little more of this now, but I, I I don't understand why we don't have more like six hour seasons of drama or like four hour seasons of uh, of comedies. Uh, yeah, I think I think or or like kind of looking at it a little differently, like some episodes only need to be 40 minutes long. Some episodes could be, you know, an hour and 10 minutes. Yeah. And kind of sticking very tightly between like 50 and 60 minutes to get that hour, you know, block feels I, like kind of a waste. Yeah, it's it's artificial. I, did you um did you watch? Uh, now we're getting into the did you watch portion of the conversation. Did you watch Wormwood? Uh, I've not. I give it a mild recommendation. It's interesting, but it's it's six six episodes of between forty and sixty minutes each. Um, but it should have been a two hour movie, not a mm -hmm. not a like innovative six episode miniseries mm -hmm. um just because there's all there's a lot of um slack in it and a lot of repetition but it's 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 interesting yeah. um so yeah so the, i mean ex the experimentation is happening uh i'm kind of i'm curious to see uh how the new the upcoming fx series on the getty kidnappings uh, uh the getty kidnapping plays compared to uh the movie that just came out last at the end of last year mm -hmm. uh, uh because i think there is something there is something very interesting in this idea that you know on the one, we've got a two-hour movie on the one hand, and we've got, I guess it's, I can't remember if it's, I can't remember how many episodes it is, but a longer TV show on the other. And just to see, like, what one keeps what, while the other one jettisons, to see how how the two different medium uh, uh, media kind of uh, monkey with that story. Mm -hmm. um, so we mentioned, you, you brought up before that, like, there's pretty much no physical way you can watch all of this, and unless it's even if it's your full time job, and you note that in the um, the Seppenwall uh, book, who's who's the other guy who? who uh, Sites. Yeah, that's all the sites of um, yeah. of the top one hundred um, series. There's like a dozen that one or the other did not actually watch. Mm -hmm. So even the even the like grand masters of TV criticism, <laughs> you know, have yeah. have holes in their in their. Uh, their film, their viewing history. Um, I mean, it, it's, it reminds me, it does remind me somewhat of, of books again. Like there's no, there's no way to read all the classics. Like I guess Harold Bloom has done it, but maybe probably no one else has. And there, and yeah. if you're reading all the classics, there's no way to stay current with the, the latest fiction. Like right. it, it's just, it's just impossible. And you kind of have to, <laughs> you kind of have to accept that. Whereas with movie, with movies, it is more like you kind of can see the big movies, um, every year, like you can see all the Oscar nominated movies and that's not like a huge, you know, yeah. uh, burden <laughs> on your life. Right. Right. Well, yeah. So I, I, I do think that there's, uh, there's something to be said for, look, I mean, the easiest rejoinder to the argument that there's too much TV out there is that there's too much of everything out there. Like I can't, I couldn't watch all the movies that came out in a year, even if I wanted to, there's, you know, 500 uh, you know, major and minor releases. Uh, I, I certainly couldn't read all the books that came out in every year. There's an endless, vast wasteland of you know, pulped, soon to be pulped books. Yeah. Uh, and and it, there's something similar to be said about TV. Um, the difference is that you can dip back into what stands the test of time with relative ease. Right. Like if I if I wanted to go back and read Moby Dick or Bleak House or um, or, you know, Pride and Prejudice. I, I like recommend it, reading Bleak House. Yeah. <laughs> I read it so five I, years ago. It's really good. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I haven't read Bleak House, but I did read Tale of Two Cities last year just because I was like, you know, I, it had come up in a couple things. I was like, all right, you know, let's read it. And it took it took a little while to read. I'm not the fastest reader in the world. Um, but you know, it, it, it was done in five hours mm -hmm. and four hours or whatever. And, and that simply just, it's not the case with, with TV. It's, it's so much, so much, even if you know exactly what you want to watch, watching it will still take a long time. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you can't you can't skim. Although there are those weird people who like watch at two x speed with subtitles. Those people, those people are the worst. There was I I I God, I saw that there was it was the Washington Post. I think the guy was writing about like I watch all my shows at one point five speed now, <laughs> and I was just like, you're this is anti art. This is like <laughs> this is not just like aesthetically displeasing to me. It is like against the purpose and nature of art. <laughs> Um, so you, uh, you mentioned something in the essay that I didn't know about Botticelli being kind of like, like forgotten in his, yeah. in his era and the sub- subsequent eras, but was reclaimed by art historians and fans of Botticelli. Do you, th- do you think there's something out there from the recent past that like is the forgotten thing that maybe people will come, come back to? Yeah. I, I wonder about this sometimes. I like, it's it's hard to say because I really there are shows that I like and think haven't been really appreciated enough, like say Oz or Deadwood, but those are also shows that like I think I think have never really been lost. Like the experts always have kind of appreciated what was going on there. Um, you know, I, I, a show like Malcolm in the Middle is very interesting hmm. because it's it is it's one of the very first single camera sitcoms on network TV, if not the first single camera uh, sitcom on network TV. Um, and it was doing kind of interesting things with the form. And I, I and it, and it is, it is, it has all of the like pluses and minuses of sitcoms in the networks, you know, in the, in the late nineties, early aughts. Um, but it is also like it, there, the, the stories also tend to be pretty well told. The actors tend to be pretty good. I mean, it's Brian Cranston's first big role that kind of brought, brought him to everyone's attention. Yeah, and um, outside it, of and Allison Janney is the mother, Al- right? Uh, no, um, not Allison Janney. Um, Jane Kaczmarek. Oh, okay, I'm getting money. Yeah. Um, but but, like, but she's another good actress. I like every. Uh, and so, like there, there, there are shows like that. I think that may wind up being, you know, kind of rescued at some some later date. Uh, it, you know, part of the problem with writing this piece is, you know thinking about what will be popular a hundred years from now is kind of a mugs game because who, who, who knows, but I do like to think about these things and I like to think about how we think about art. Yeah. And and just going back to the comparison with literature, I mean, there's the artists who were like, like Dickens was, was like a superstar in his day and everyone loved him and the, you know, uh, we still continue to read them today. And then there's like the artists, none are immediately coming to mind, but <laughs> the people who were, you know, kind of semi obscure and right. well, uh, like Moby Dick, right? Like, Moby oh yeah, Dick that's sold a, a thousand example. copies when it was on its first run and everyone kind of forgot about it. And then, you know, at the, I guess at the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century, it's when he started being reappreciated or maybe, maybe later. I can't remember. But the point is he was not, yeah, and, well, well yeah, and and cultural, you know, Fitzgerald was very popular, and then, but died in relative penury, and had a, a kind of a trough of, of critical understanding, and then uh, slowly came back, so that you know everyone reads Fitzgerald today. Um, before you go, uh, what since you are a critic, what are you consuming right now that um, uh, that you're well, enjoying? We- my wife and I just finished the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, um, uh, on, uh, uh, Amazon. Mm -hmm. We quite like that. Uh, I described it as, uh, mad men, but woke to somebody recently, which (laughs) which is like, it's very much in the, you know, uh, the whole, it's like in that kind of mad men era, but like women's Mm live. We got it. Um, uh, so I, I really, I like that. Uh, I've been watching the X files reboot, which is like the first time I've watched network TV. Or not reboot, but you know, kind of sequel, mm-hmm. whatever they they went away for fifteen years and now they they came back, which has been like it is really kind of a fascinating throwback in this era of you know prestige TV. It is very much like the show used to be. It hasn't really changed that much, mm-hmm. and that is both charming in a way and also like really shows its age and kind of how how the the form has evolved over the last. I don't know, 15 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, uh, what else am I, what else am I watching? Uh, the, the show that I am 
most excited for to come back is Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. uh, which I love. I, I'm a total sucker for Veep and Silicon Valley. Um, uh, but this is not, I'm not taking a brave stand. Here. Yeah, I'm, I'm sad that Ehrlich um, is no longer going to be on the show because I thought he was yeah. such a funny character. Although yeah. apparently the actor has some uh, <laughs> less than Issues. admirable qualities. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, we, my, my, we had to decide whether to drop our HBO Go um, subscription and or and just pick it up again when Game of Thrones comes back on. Mm. And I think Silicon Valley was like the only thing that was was keeping yeah. me. Uh, yeah, to... well, I mean that that'll be that'll be over soon, and then it's another eighteen months until Game of Thrones comes back. It's funny you you mentioned Game of Thrones, and I saw somebody, uh, I think it was an HBO exec, say that you know. They really owed it to the people to create five spin-off Game of Thrones series <laughs> because Game of Thrones is the last iteration of the monoculture. And I just like huh. I, I it's such a fascinating thing to think about Game of Thrones, which is watched by 15 to 20 million people about uh, being uh, a, a signifier of the monoculture since that's five percent of the American population. I mean, like I just compare it to. Uh, I, you know, Friends, which drew twice that many viewers, or, you know, MASH, which was doing, you know, 25, 30% of the population on any, uh, uh, on any given night. I, I, you know, I, it's, it's a weird, the, 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 the explosion of TV has been bad for the idea of culture as any sort of unified thing. Mm -hmm. Um, which is another kind of reason I had started talking about this piece and writing it as just like, there is no monoculture anymore. Not even Game of Thrones. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree with that. And 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 speaking of the good old days, um, have you rewatched Friends as an, an adult? <laughs> uh, I I've not rewatched it in any sort of serious way, but my wife does watch it sometimes on Netflix if she you know just wants to kill twenty or thirty minutes, and it is fascinating to go back and. I th kind of uh, were you, my wife and I rewatched it when it got on Netflix two or three years ago, and I thought it, hold up, it held up surprisingly well. I mean, there's some things that are a little uh, problematic, as they say, but, um, I mean, the joke structure is is, it, kill, is well, killer. Totally. It's, it, I mean, it really is like a perfect three-camera sitcom. Like, that form, starting with, you know, I Love Lucy kind of perfected it, and, uh, you know, every generation or so has a perfect version of it. You know, there's MASH, and then the Cosby show and then Seinfeld and friends. And I guess now it's big bang theory, right? That's like the mm -hmm. three, three camera sitcom of, of the day. Um, uh, but I do think that like the, the, there's something to be said for that format and doing it well. I like, it's, it's an art form like any other. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess the final question would be, um, if, if the canon, if there is some kind of canon, what do you think like has, like has to be on it? Just if you can name, if you can name a couple. Would, if, yeah, if I'm if I'm form, if I'm putting like a time capsule together, uh, the first entry in it, the first thing I stick in there is going to be my Deadwood Blu-rays, uh, assuming that the future people can watch the Blu-rays. I don't, I don't know if they, but like that would be that would be number one for me. I think it's a, I think it's an interesting and um, uh, I don't think it's underrated. I think it's properly rated. I think most critics would say that it's a great TV show, but it is slightly underappreciated by the masses, I think. Uh, and it is a fascinating work that does a lot of, um, it is, it's like slightly timeless in its own way. It, it takes place out of our own time, of course, but also, uh, uh, will take, will, is kind of universal in its ideas about the nature of society and how that forms and how, business interact with government and like all sorts of like little kind of cool ideas. Plus, you know, lots of violence and nudity. Got to keep the people interested. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so I would, I would include that. I'd probably include, uh, uh, Seinfeld just as a, um, kind of, again, the idea, kind of the ideal of the three camera sitcom, not only in terms of joke structure, but also kind of like taking the form down a peg as well. There's, it does interesting um, things, things with the idea. Uh, and you know, if I had to, I, I, I don't know what I would pick if I was going to pick something from the streaming era. Um, stranger things is interesting, but I don't think it's great. Uh, house of cards. The first season was kind of fun, but uh, is, is, is not a very good show. 
mm-hmm. really. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I am kind of at a loss to, to, to think of, uh, something from this kind of our like post, uh, basically post breaking bad era, like that would, that would, that will ha- hold up and stand the test of time. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know what I would pick from the stream era. Maybe, maybe Kimmy Schmidt, um, which is very, very funny, but I, I, it's, I don't know if it's like innovative in, in any way, but yeah, it's very well done. Um, yeah, maybe love. I just started watching Love season three, and that that, mm. that is doing things a little bit differently with the uh, with the format. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, cool. I don't know. I don't know. I don't... Uh, so, viewers, um, sound off in the comments. What would <laughs> what would you include in the time capsule or the you know the syllabus for the uh, TV studies course, a hundred years in the future? Um, Sunny, thanks so much for coming on. Where can people find yeah. more of your stuff? Uh, I. Uh... Just you can follow me on Twitter. That's probably the easiest way to get get all of my stuff. Uh, just at Sunny Bunch. Cool. And I'm at R E A C W. Um, uh, thanks to everyone for listening or watching. Thanks, Sunny, for coming on, and we'll see you again next time.